Greetings. Welcome to the podcast edition of my book, Indiana's Role in the Civil War. The book includes this short history of the war, a county-by-county listing of Civil War-related historical markers installed by the Indiana Historical Bureau with my additional background material on the marker. The final section of the book features short historical sketches on the cavalry, artillery, and, reg- and infantry regiments that served in the war from Indiana. This is the second of eight podcasts that will deal with the Civil War historical markers in Indiana. This week we will visit Davies, Dearborn, and Decatur counties while we learn the origins of the Medal of Honor as well as the murder of a draft enrollment officer in Davies County. A historical marker located at the United Methodist Cemetery near Washington in Davies County honors Captain Eli McCarty. Title of the marker, Burial Site of Captain Eli McCarty, location, United States Methodist Ebenezer Cemetery, State Road 257 and County Road 725, east side of Highway, six miles south of Washington in Davies County, Indiana. Marker text, during the Civil War on October the 3rd, 1864, Davis County Draft Officer Will McCart- Eli McCarty was murdered by anti-war draft protesters. Five men were convicted of his murder. Reportedly, several other men involved fled west. I have written just a little bit more about this incident as follows. Captain Eli McCarty, November the 28th, 1828 through October the 3rd, 1864. A native of Davis County, Eli was a son of James and Elizabeth, Elizabeth McCarty. Eli married Sarah V. Lundy Allen in 1857. Together they had four daughters. He served during the Mexican War during the years from 1846 through 1848. He enlisted in the Union Army in in the 42nd Regiment Army Volunteers, Company C, on September 23, 1860, after receiving wounds at the Battle of Perryville, Kentucky, on October 8, 1861, the the Army discharged him for disability on March 16, 1862. After passage of the Draft Act in 1863, he received appointment as a draft officer to notify draftees of their status and requirement to report for enlistment. The Draft Act passed Congress on March 3, 1863. The Act provided for a military draft to enlist the soldiers necessary to carry on the Civil War. The law stipulated that all males between 20 and 45 years of age enroll in the draft. To administer the draft, a state provost marshal general headed each state. Rule that the law created several enrollment boards in each state, headed by a district general provost marshal. Each district enrollment board employed a number of clerks, deputies, and special agents. These boards were further divided into sub-districts, had enrollment officers to register the eligible male and notifies them when they were drafted. The act allowed men to evade the draft by either paying a fine of $300 or finding someone to serve in their place. The evasion methods created a great deal of unrest in the lower classes who could not afford the $300, a substantial sum in 1862. This created riots in some cities and general discontent everywhere. Many residents of Davis County opposed the war and the draft. Some stated that if they were notified that they had been drafted, they would kill the notifying agent. Many residents held meetings in which they voiced their displeasure over the war and the draft. On October 3, 1864, McCarthy left his home to notify several men that they were compelled to report for the enrollment board. Brothers Samuel and Thornton Slicer, Jr. were the first to stop. The Slicers had threatened him with death before he took his leave. He then had dinner with his friend, William Jackson. Jackson noted that McCarthy, McCarty was uneasy and upon hearing why, offered to accompany him on his next stops. McCarty declined, then left for the next two stops, William Madden and James Nash. He then stopped at the Maccabee home to notify them, but no one was home. As he rode home, Slicer and William Madden, who had been following him, accosted him and began to chase him. As McCarthy, as McCarty fled, others joined in the chase. John McAvoy, waiting in ambush, shot and killed him. The assassins, five in all, found McCarty's horse and used it to carry the body to a river. They weighted it down and sank it in the water. But others had seen the murder, and soon the countryside they arose, a posse formed, and a search mounted. The five men were captured. The authorities took the five men, John McAvoy, Daniel Scales, William Whitesides, Washington Hedrick, and Yoakum Scott to Indianapolis to stand trial. All were convicted and sentenced to the penitentiary. Marker at the end of Walnut Street in Lawrenceburg in Dearborn County marks the spot Abraham Lincoln delivered a speech. Inscription, 
Abraham Lincoln made a famous pre-inaugural speech from this train platform near here, February the 12th, 1861, placing emphasis on the people's part in justice and good government. The marker denotes the spot where Abraham Lincoln stopped for his speech during his inaugural, inaugural tour that began on February the 11th, 1861. He would stop at 10 cities in Indiana before entering Ohio. Abraham Lincoln spent his boyhood years in southern Indiana. Lincoln State Park preserved some of the sights and memories important to Lincoln as he was growing up. Nancy Hanks Lincoln presented her husband Thomas with a son on February the 12th, 1809. He was born on the Sinking Spring Farm in Hardin County, Kentucky. When Abraham was a boy of seven, Thomas moved the family to southern Indiana. Thomas had been a wealthy Kentucky farmer until 1816 when he lost all his land due to a faulty property line disputes. He moved his family to Indiana where the property laws provided better title to land. Thomas was also staunchly anti-slavery. Kentucky was a slave state while Indiana was not. Abraham would live in Spencer County in Indiana until March 1830 when the Lincoln family moved to Decatur, Illinois. During their stay in Indiana, Abe's mother, Nancy Hanks Lincoln, would die of milk sickness, and his sister Sarah would die ch during childbirth. Lincoln obtained his law degree in Illinois and began his political career there, culminating with a successful run for president in 1860. Lincoln began his whistle-stop tour on Monday, the February the 11th, 1861, at Springfield, Illinois. His stops in Indiana included State Line City, Lafayette, Indiana, Thorntown, Indiana, Lebanon, Indiana, Zionsville, Indianapolis, Shelbyville, Greensburg, Morris, and Lawrenceburg. At approximately 7.30 a.m. on uh, February the 11th, President Abraham Lincoln left the railway station without his wife, who will join him later. As Lincoln boarded the train at Springfield's Great Western Railroad Depot, he said to the crowd, to this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. I now leave with a task before me greater than that which listed upon George Washington. As he crossed Illinois, he stopped at Decatur Train Depot, Tolano Train Station, Vermilion County Train Depot. He finally reached Indiana. He got off the train to address a crowd that gathered at State Line City. For being joined by a committee of Indiana politicians in State Line City, Lincoln spoke before a crowd in Lafayette. Quote, while some of us may differ in political opinions, still we are all united in one feeling for the nation. We all believe in the maintenance of the union of every star and every stripe of the glorious flag, and permit me to express the sentiment upon that union of the states. There shall be between us no difference, unquote. He continued through Indiana, stopping Thorntown, Lebanon, and Zionsville before stopping to speak again at, Le at Indianapolis, Indiana. Lincoln arrived at 5 o'clock p.m., welcomed by Gov Governor Oliver P. Morton and a 34-gun salute. He joined a procession of 20,000 state legislators, public employees, soldiers, firemen, and others. For the first time in his journey, he temporarily lost copies of his inaugural address. He spent overnight in Indianapolis and continued his journey on Tuesday, February the 12th, 1861. After passing through Shelbyville and Greensburg and Morris, he stopped at Lawrenceburg, Indiana to speak once more. He crossed the state line after speaking, he crossed the state line at Cincinnati, Ohio, where he once again stepped off the train. At a public re reception held by the German Industrial Association, Lincoln says, quote, I deem it my duty that I should wait until the last moment for a development of the present national difficulties before I express myself decidedly on what course I shall pursue, unquote. His reluctance to make definitive public statements on the secession crisis was an ongoing theme of his remarks on his journey. Escorted by members of the Ohio legislature, Oat Lincoln departed on Little Miami Railroad at 9 o'clock a.m. the following morning, headed for Washington, D.C. At the southeast corner of State Road 101 and County Road 900 North stands a Ferris schoolhouse, historical marker denoting the route of Colonel John T. Morgan's route through Dearborn County is here. The title of the marker is Exhausted Morgan Troops, and the inscription is, The structure still stands and has been converted to a private residence. General Morgan spent the evening of July the 12th, 1863, inside the school while his exhausted troopers camped at the present-day St. Paul Cemetery. Morgan and his raiders had ridden approximately 45 miles that day, and 150 miles in the last four days. 
Another marker nearby in Dover Reeds marched east along this road July the 13th, 1863, on his raid across southern Indiana. I will have a full section later on covering General Morgan's progress across the state. At 215 High Street in Lawrenceburg, we find a marker honoring Dearborn County's Medal of Honor recipients. The uh, inscription here is, names these uh, recipients. They would be uh, Private William Shepard, May the 3rd, 1865, Private Frank Stoltz, July the 9th, 1894, Private David M. H. Helms, July the 26th, 1894, Tom, Private Thomas A. Blasdell, August the 11th, 1894, Private John W. Conway, August the 11th, 1894, and Private William W. Chisholm, August the 15th, 1894. The marker was erected in 18, 1966 by the Legion Post of Dearborn County. I've got a short history of the Medal of Honor. Uh, it was established by Congress during the beginning days of the American Civil War on December the 21st, 1862. The law that authorized the December 9th resolution introduced by Iowa Senator James W. Grimes this Medal of Honor was to promote the was to quote promote the efficiency of the Navy unquote by awarding a medal for acts that went above and beyond the call of duty. Congress authorized an Army version on July the twelfth, eighteen sixty two. The Air Force received a version on April the fourteenth, nineteen sixty five. The Medal of Honor is awarded only to members of the United States military. Marines and Coast Guard personnel receive the naval version of the medal. Late, a request for awarding a medal of honor ascends up through the chain of command from the proposed recipient's commanding officer until it reaches the Secretary of Defense, who will pass the recommendation on to a member of Congress. Typically, this member is from the proposed recipient's congressional district. Alternatively, a member of Congress can introduce a resolution without this chain of command. The chain of command process can take up to 18 months to complete. If Congress approves a resolution to award, resolution to award the Medal of Honor to an individual, the President of the United States personally awards the medal to the recipient at a White House ceremony in the name of Congress. If the award is posthumous or the recipient is unable to participate, the next of kin will receive the award in their stead. Currently, Congress has awarded 3,515 Medals of Honor since its establishment during the Civil War. Current guidelines for awarding the Medal of Honor established by Congress in 1963 are, number one, while engaged in, a mil in an action against an enemy of the United States, number two, while engaged in a military operations involving conflict with an opposing foreign force, or three, while serving with friendly forces engaged in armed com conflict against an opposing armed force in which the United States is not a belligerent party. The Congressional Medal of Honor Society you can reach them at 40 Patriots Point Road, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, 29464. And on the web, it is www.cmohs.org. Visitors to Greensburg, well, Indiana, will find this historical marker at the corner of Indiana State Road 46 and Poplar Street. Title of the marker, Civil War General John T. Wilder. Location, north side of 446 Main Street, State Road 46 at Poplar Street in Greensburg and Decatur County. Marker text, Wilder, 1830 through 1917, resident of Greensburg, circa 1858 through 1869, built, it to home, built this home in 1865 through 1866. He was a millwright and inventor, provided major employment in the area. Enlisted in the Civil War, appointed Lieutenant Colonel of the 17th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, 1861, by Indiana Governor Oliver P. Morton. Side 2. In 1863, Wilder commanded a brigade which included mounted infantry equipment armed with new Spencer repeating rifles. Use of the rifles helped troops defeat Confederates at Hoosier, Hoover's Gap, earned them the nickname Wilder's Lightning Brigade. Wilder was breveted Brigadier General in 1864 after Chickamauga. I've written just a little bit more about uh, Mr. Or, uh, General Wilder. Gen John T. Wilder was the son of Reuben and Mary Merritt Wilder, and John T. Would, could claim descent from heroes. His grandfather and great-grandfather saw action in the Revolutionary War. 
His father fought in the War of 1812. When the Civil War erupted, John T. Wilder would join their ranks. General John T. Wilder lived from January the 31st through 8, 1830 through October the 20th, 1917. His home in the Catskill Mountains near Hunter, New York, John T. Wilder left his home at 19 for Ohio. In Ohio, he would find his career. He worked as a draftsman and then became apprenticed to a millwright. From Ohio, he migrated to Indiana in 1858 to live in the town of Greensburg. In Greensburg, he established the foundry, which became quite successful. While living in Greensburg, he invented and patented many different machines. He sold his machineries all over Indiana and in neighboring states. Wilder enlisted, receiving the rank of private. The men of his company, Company A, 17th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, elected him as captain. Governor Oliver P. Morton commissioned him as a lieutenant colonel, and by spring of 1862, the company found itself at the Battle of Shiloh. His performance at that battle earned him a promotion to full colonel and command of the 17th Indiana. Wilder and his 17th saw extensive action during the war. Two incidents stand out. At Munfordville, Tennessee, Wilder commanded three regiments totaling 4,000 men and behind extensive fortifications. Confederate General Braxton Bragg advanced toward him with approximately 22,000 soldiers. Bragg completely surrounded Wilder and then demanded a surrender. Wilder demanded to see Confederate positions. Rebel soldiers led a blindfolded Wilder behind their lines and removed the blindfold to show Wilder their overwhelming superiority. Wilder, after considering his situation, said, quote, well, it seems to me that I ought to surrender, unquote. He did so, and the Confederates held him prisoner for two months. They exchanged they exchange him for some Confederate prisoners, and he resumed duty. Upon his return to duty, he received command of the 1st Brigade of the Army of the Cumberland. This brigade included his old unit, the 17th Indiana. During this time, an idea to mount his brigade inspired him to experiment. A first trial using mules from the wagon trains failed. His superior officer, Major General William S. Roscrans, supported the idea and gave him leave to forage the countryside for horses. The army was in rebel country, so they just commandeered whatever horses they found. The muskets in use at the time proved too clumsy for mounted soldiers, so Wilder searched for alternatives. He found it in the Spencer repeating rifle. Wanting this rifle, which held seven rounds of rimfire 56 caliber metallic cartridges, he requested his men to vote on purchasing them. To avoid an army red tape, which could take months and result in a denial, the men voted in approval. Wilder appealed to the banks in Greensburg, and they responded by lending out the $35 needed for each weapon to purchase the weapons. Using these weapons, his brigade helped avert a total Union disaster at Chickamauga and successfully held Hoover's Gap against a devastating rebel assault. Wilder had contracted typhoid in 1862 and suffered bouts of severe dysentery. Exhausted by his ill health, he resigned his commission in late 1864. He retired to Greensburg, where he lived until 1869. He eventually left the area and went south, eventually serving as the mayor of Chattanooga in 1871. President William McKinley appointed him commissioner of Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park. He died in Jacksonville, Florida at 87 years old and is interred in Forest Hill Cemetery in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Find out more about Indiana's role in the Civil War by purchasing the book. You will find it on my website, www.mossyfeetbooks.com, on the Indiana Short History Series category. There are links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, and other online booksellers. You may choose to purchase the book in ebook or softbound versions. An audiobook version is available on Google Play. Residents of southeastern Indiana can find my books at the Walnut Street Variety Shop on George Street in Batesville. At the conclusion of this series, I will compile the episodes into an audiobook. The audiobook will be available in Audible, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, as well as many other audiobook sellers. You can listen to this pod podcast on many platforms, including Apple, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, and Amazon Music, as well as many others. Video versions are available on YouTube and Rumble. You can also order the books direct from me, the author, on the webpage. If you wish to sign me a book, just send me an email to me at mossyfeetbooks at gmail.com requesting a signed book and instructions on how you want me to address it. Note, if you send me an email, I will add you to my contact list. Readers on the list will receive an email from me announcing when I publish a new book. 
If you do not want me to add you to the list, tell me and I will not add you. Listen to this podcast on email notification of my new releases and just send me an email requesting addition to the list. You can choose to have your, remo- your name removed at any time. If you browse the website, you will find dozens of sample chapters.